I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 1, if you would. Today is what is called Pentecost Sunday. What I would like to do is focus our attentions on the ascension of Jesus as well as the movement of Jesus to pour out the Holy Spirit on His people. I have a confession to make as we begin, and that is that in the churches in which I grew up, which were primarily from the tradition that this church belongs to, which is the Restoration Movement, the Churches of Christ, we had the big holidays about Jesus on the calendar. We had Christmas, which of course marks the wonder and the miracle and the gift of Jesus coming to us in flesh on that night in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, angels announcing it, right? All of that spectacular. Also on our calendar was a celebration of Palm Sunday, which is the remembrance of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on that donkey on the Sunday before his suffering and death. We would celebrate and remember very uh, purposefully in our calendar what we call Good Friday, the day that Jesus died, and Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday when he was raised to life. These were the primary things on our Christian calendar, so to speak, in terms of uh, as we worshipped as a church. The birth of Jesus, the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, suffering of Jesus and death, and then his resurrection. And that was about it. And so after after Easter or Resurrection Sunday, you would basically have an open calendar for other holidays like Mother's Day, Father's Day, things like that, until you get back to Christmas. Well, what I know of other traditions is something that I've come to appreciate and actually believe that we ought to take uh, the lead that they have given us, which is to acknowledge within our calendar as a church within our habitual practice of choosing to remember in our timeline of life with Christ, these monumental events of Jesus being taken back into heaven and then Jesus, by God's authority, pouring out the Holy Spirit on His people. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And I would like to encourage you to consider that with me, whether we as a church can incorporate this into our habitual uh, remembrance of the timeline because it is so crucial. And I want to look with you at Acts chapter 1 because there aren't actually very many details about the return of Jesus to heaven from earth. Matthew does not talk about it. He doesn't mention it. He gives us the Great Commission in chapter 28, and that's it. That's the end. Uh, In the book of Mark, there is a line in in our Bibles, in Mark 16, the ending there, where there's a, a brief statement that after Jesus did these things, he was taken back up to heaven. But that's the ending of Mark that has been called into question whether Mark actually wrote that. It's a it's most likely for looking at the evidence. It's most likely an an ending that was added on later that kind of summarizes what we learn other places from, especially from Luke's writings. So okay, what we'll say, let's just say that Mark didn't include that in his original ending. Luke does. He ends Luke with that, and then he begins. Acts with that. That's the bridge between Luke and Acts is the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And then John does not talk about this either in his narrative. There's references throughout John of Jesus returning to the Father, but never the description of the event. Okay, So, all of this to say, what little we have, we should really take note of. Because this is a really big deal. It was important to God, it was important to Jesus, and it should be important to us because we love Him. And it was so important what happened. So let's do this reading, and we're going to read Acts 1, chapter, verses 1 to 11, and we need to pray and ask God's grace on us as we do look at these things together. Father, we come acknowledging that 
We are a people that are prone to misunderstand or to miss things that are important or to be distracted in these times. And we thank you for your love and grace in the midst of these tendencies of of ours. But we also know, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, you can give us what we need to be focused and to understand and to hear what needs to be heard and to uh, just benefit fully from this time in your word. And so we ask you to do that, that you would do something supernatural as a gift to your people because we want this word to sink into us, to shape us so that we can be the people you intend us to be. And I ask this all in his wonderful name, the name Jesus. Amen. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, that makes sense, right? He also wrote this sequel, if you want, the book of Acts, which covers what happens in the church after Jesus' departure to heaven. Now when he says he instructed the apostles, remember that there's 11 now because one of the apostles who betrayed Jesus, Judas, he has taken his own life. And so 11 apostles remain, and these are the ones receiving the instructions from Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, after his suffering, after his suffering, which includes his death, that's important for what he's about to write here, after his suffering, he presented himself to them, the apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now, having read Luke, Theophilus, and we know that when Luke says after his suffering, Luke is talking about the death of Jesus also, culminating in his death. That's why it's so shocking that he's showing convincingly and proving convincingly that he's alive because he was dead. I mean, like real dead, okay? (laughs) Fully dead. Luke goes on here. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Did you know that? That that little detail there doesn't get a lot of air time, but that's significant. That's important. Because God chose this for a reason. God did it this way on purpose, right? After God raises His Son from the dead... He has His Son remain on this earth as a resurrected person for 40 days. Now you think about why would Jesus want to be here for 40 more days when He's most likely really desiring to be with Father. That's the tone I get from reading His prayer in John 17. He's really eager to return to Father. He's done the work Father gave him to do. He says it is finished on the cross. Now, he's not done working, but he's done the work he was given to do on earth, it sounds like. Why is he hanging around for 40 more days, right? And it's not like he's just he wants to get a few more earthly kicks in before he leaves the planet, you know, eat a few more fish tacos there along the Sea of Galilee and smell some more flowers. Like, like what, he's going to miss out on things if he doesn't take in some sights before he leaves? No. Look, heaven, I'm guessing, from everything we know, is like way better than what earth in Galilee, in Israel. So why is he sticking around for 40 days? What's he up to? Well, Luke tells us, fortunately. This is another little known fact. When Jesus was resurrected, he spent time with his disciples in order to instruct them even more about the kingdom of God. That is hugely important. Because in his mortal ministry, Jesus obsessed about talking and living out the kingdom of God. And even after his death and resurrection, he's still focusing on that exact reality. And that's a clue for us, isn't it? Right, As disciples of Jesus, if you want to know what we ought to obsess about, we've got to look at what he obsessed about. And it was, hands down, no questions, it's the kingdom of God that is invading this world dominated by the kingdom of darkness. 
So he's preparing his disciples because he's about to leave. He knows it and he wants them to be ready. They're going to carry on in his power in just a little bit in in continuing the work of the kingdom of God. Verse 4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, wasn't that one of his convincing proofs that he was alive? Right? He's, he's in the room and I'm not a ghost because that's an obvious thing that would come to their minds. I'm not a ghost. Do ghosts eat? And he asked them if they have any food and he ate it in front of them and apparently he did that several times. So on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's giving us a little hint and a clue of what's coming up in chapter 2, which is the second part of our focus today. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now he's been talking to them about the kingdom of God and they're still not quite grasping where he's going with all this. Now he never tells them, now listen to his response in a second here, but he, listen, notice he never tells them that they're wrong, that God's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. He never says, well guys, that's not what this is about. This is not where that's headed. However, look what he does do. He refocuses them. He says, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. The implication is that he is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. But he gets to decide that timing-wise. That's, that's his prerogative as king of Israel. But Jesus doesn't say, so don't worry about any of that. You know, None of that is your concern. What he does say, okay, when it happens is above your pay grade, that is, you know, you, you don't have security clearance for that kind of classified information, right? But he does say there's something you're going to be doing in God's process of bringing it about, right? Look at, notice what he says here, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you don't worry about if it's happening right now. You worry about what your job is right now. Though I shouldn't say right now, because there is a waiting period. Once they get the power, once they get the promised gift. Verse 9, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, I really need to pause here. I need to take a moment with you to try myself and invite you to take this in as best you can from an ancient human perspective. Because we live in an age in which it is very common for humans to go into the sky. We've done it, most of us. We've seen others do it. You look up in the sky at certain times, you can see the planes going overhead. People going into the sky, into the heavens, and not just this first heaven of the atmosphere, but even even into the second heavens with the astronauts and NASA and, you know, several countries now have sent human beings into space. There's an international space station where people actually live in the sky. They live in the heavens, briefly. We talk seriously as human beings about the prospect that we will put people on other planets or on the moon to live there. Wow. Now that is, is, we're at the point now in, in technological advancements and things like that where that actually is not completely ludicrous anymore, Right? You don't necessarily have to believe we're going to do that, but it actually, people seriously talk about this. We have superhero movies where, where people are shown in the movies and on TV to be jumping, shooting up into the sky and flying around, you know? So this idea, we're kind of inoculated to the wonder of this, but listen, whether you're ancient or modern, nobody has ever seen 
what those men saw. That in real life, a human being, glorified, yes, but a human being nonetheless, a human being was standing on earth and was taken up without jetpacks, without planes, without helicopter, without a balloon, right? No rocket power, none of that. He was simply taken up, whatever that means. We don't have a lot of details here. He was simply taken up into heaven and he was hidden from their sight by a cloud. Never done before. There is maybe one example in the in the history of the people of Israel where we know a person was taken up into the sky. He had a chariot, a flaming chariot and a whirlwind. That was Elijah. Do you remember that? One person saw that and that was Elisha. You got to see it. Jesus, though? No mention of a chariot, no mention of a whirlwind. It's just taken up. And these 11 men and maybe others are there watching it as it happens. And it would have been the most incredible thing to watch. They were witnesses that Jesus was alive. They did not see the resurrection event. This they watched happen though. The ascension event. They watched it with their eyes. And it was like nothing else anyone had ever seen in the history of mankind. And no one since has seen anything like that. That's not the end of it, though. They were looking intently up into the sky. This is in verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky. Yes, they were as he was going. And when then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. I don't know if they even noticed these two guys appear because they're so intently fixated on the wonder of what they just saw. Their master left into the sky. And the clouds hid him from our sight. And they're just gazing up intently. And here's what these two men in white say. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The obvious answer is, because my master just went up there. But here's why they asked. They want them to know something. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen Him go into heaven. This is a profoundly important truth for us, uh, whether we're modern or ancient people, because we love Jesus and we desire His return. Amen? We love Jesus and we desire His return. It's really good to know that when He comes, it will be obvious and clear. In fact, Jesus gives us more information about it. He says, like the lightning flashes on one side of the sky and you can see it on the other. He said east and west. And, you know, It could be north, south. It doesn't really matter the directions. If, if the lightning flashes anywhere in the sky, you'll see the effect of that lightning flash everywhere. This happened not long ago here with our big old thunderstorm that went by. I don't know where the lightning was. I have no idea where the lightning was, but I know that inside our house, the whole place burst with light. Inside the house, let alone all over the sky outside. Why? That's the nature of lightning's powerful, glorious flash. And Jesus compared his return in the sky that same way. It's not going to be secretive. You aren't going to have to hear about it word of mouth. There's not going to be posts on Facebook that alert you to Jesus being found down in South America or over there in Indonesia somewhere. Jesus' return will be obvious and plain to everybody. You're not going to miss it. And He's going to come down out of heaven just as He went up into heaven. And what a glorious promise that is. One of the reasons we're so desperate for His return is that He left. After 40 days of being on earth as a resurrected man with His disciples, you, I mean, just help me, you know, help me with it, with this. You are trying to imagine like I am what it would be like to be those first disciples where you have this amazing, unparalleled, incomparable man named Jesus of Nazareth ministering in a way no one's ever done before. No one's ever seen or heard anyone like this before. He is now convincingly understood to be the Messiah by these men. And then he is murdered shamefully and publicly on a cross 
He is humiliated. He is defeated. That's how it looks. He's defeated because he's dead. And th- we have the word of certain disciples, not the apostles, but a certain disciple who said, we thought we had hoped he was the one. That's a past tense statement of disappointment. That was what we were hoping. But obviously now that he's dead, that's not true. So that's what they go through. And then he comes back to life by God's power on the third day. First day of the week, but third day of his death. And he convinces them with multiple sightings, multiple proofs that he is alive. He's not a ghost. They're not hallucinating, right? Now they've got him back and they're eating together again. They're listening to his beautiful teachings again. It's just like it was before he died, except he kind of vanishes and appears differently (laughs) than he did in the mortal body. But then he leaves again. Oh, the heartbreak of that. And this time there's no, oh, I'll be back in three days. There was none of that. We don't know when he's going to be back. I mean, a heartbreak. But God is so kind. And he gives these men a word of peace and a word of hope and a word of encouragement. He sends these two presumably angels, I'm guessing, I mean, how many other guys in white are there in the story if they're not angels, right? But presumably there's these two angels. Two of them give witness to the fact that he is going to come back. He is leaving you. You're going to miss him properly so, but he's going to return. Right? Now, that's day 40 after his resurrection and or his death. You know, Depends on what the timing that you want to give that with Passover. At the 40-day mark, Jesus returns to heaven. Now, here's, here's what I want to focus on just for a second before we move on to Pentecost. Why is this event of the ascension so important? And the reason it's important is because there is a promise in Psalm 110, verse 1. A promise that God made through his prophet David. David wrote it down in a song. And here's what David says in his prophecy. Yahweh, the Lord, all capitalized. Yahweh says to my Lord, my Master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. One of the most consistently stated truths about Jesus throughout the New Testament is that he, when he went back to heaven, did something very particular. He sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus didn't just go back to heaven and then, like, what, retire? Because he did a lot of good stuff here on earth. He really worked hard. He really gave it his all. Um, Now he gets the reward of eternal enjoyment and relaxation in the retirement palace called heaven. Now, listen, some of us actually have been taught or we've picked up the vibe along the way that heaven is really just a a place of pure pleasure and enjoyment. You think to yourself, this is our great retirement in the sky. No, things, things could not be further from the truth here. Jesus, when he returns to heaven, capital H, heaven, the city of God, he returns to the administrative capital of God's kingdom and universal empire. He returns to the place where the work of God is centralized and then is sent out into the universe. And when Jesus gets there, you don't see him teeing off and, you know, watching movies because he did his deeds on earth. What we see is Jesus sitting down at the right hand of the Father to take charge of everything. When Jesus said it is done on the cross, he didn't mean that he was done working. What he meant was this phase of my work, this part of my mission is accomplished. But he's not done because the Father raises him to life. He teaches for 40 days about the kingdom, goes to heaven to sit at God's right hand. And while he sits there, from that day, that 40th day of Jesus' glorious return to the place from which he came, the Father's side, As a glorified human, still representing humanity, he sits down at God's right hand and he said this before he left, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, as Peter called him, is the prince. He's the prince. 
And all authority is given by Father God the King to the Prince to rule. You're like, well, that's all very interesting. Thank you for that reminder. Next, no, don't, you know, if that's your tendency, don't move on too quickly from this. Because the, this, the goal here isn't just to know, oh, that's where Jesus is currently located. No! Don't miss the significance that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, as it says in Hebrews. He is seated at a place of absolute authority and power. Absolute. There's only one being in the entire universe that is not subject to Jesus' authority, and that is the Father Himself, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But everything else in all of the universe has been given to Jesus to rule it by the Father. Now, Here's why that matters, and here's why we have to have this knowledge firmly in mind so that we can share this knowledge with the world that needs to know it. As you look around you and as I look around me, it, be, it seems so obvious and it seems so clear that there is someone in charge of this system and this way of life, but it certainly isn't a good God or a good master named Jesus. We look around, we, we hear about a school shooting in Texas. We hear about the volcano that is uh, wreaking havoc in Hawaii. We hear about all the things that have been happening in the last several years and even before that, where it seems like the world is being consumed by the darkness, by the destructive power of darkness. Then the kingdom of darkness seems to dominate. Does that resonate with anybody else? And you think, well, well, Jesus, when He comes back, will be in charge. But right now, you know, the, the darkness is in charge. And, and this is a key fact of, of truth, a knowledge that we need to hold on to. Jesus, even now, and since He ascended to be with Father, has been seated at the right hand of God and has all authority in the heavens and the earth. There's nothing outside of His domain. And what that means, when we get to the Pentecost event in just a moment, what that means is that when He sends His people out with His power and His authority, that will change what's going on in His world. Because this world belongs to Him. He has authority over this world. He is, as the apostles testify throughout the New Testament, He is over all the powers, rulers, thrones, and authorities on earth. He is, according to Revelation, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Presently. Not later when He gets here. Right now. And so what happens in chapter 2? Let's take a look at that. Acts chapter 2. Having returned to the Father, what does Jesus do? He waits about ten days. (laughs) That's a really long ten days. Jesus is actually absent from His people for ten full days. Or, I don't know, full days, but ten days. Because it's on the 50th day. That's what Pentecost means, 50th. It's on the 50th day. And that's actually a Jewish holiday. When a bunch of Jews are coming to Jerusalem to celebrate this day of Pentecost, which was originally a harvest celebration for the Jews to thank God for the harvest and to honor Him and enjoy together. And it became over time a tradition that they would also celebrate the giving of the law because they believed from their teachers and traditions that it was 50 days after their escape from from Egypt, I should say, that God gives them the law and the covenant at Sinai. And so the Pentecost celebration is both the harvest that it was originally given to be, but also... Thank you, God, for the law, for the covenant, for choosing us to be your people in this special covenant. So think about the timing. Think about the strategy of God. It was on that day of special celebration of harvest and of the giving of a covenant and the shaping of a people to belong to God in a new and special way. He does something for the new Israel the new covenant Israel that is very similar, yet so very different. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, and the people reading this originally would have known what that was as a Jewish holiday. When that holiday came, they were all together in one place, meaning these disciples numbering about 120. 
Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. The church is filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of their Master, the the Christ. I want to read what uh, Peter said after this crowd gathers because they're so curious about all these languages being spoken. Here's what Peter says as as a part of his message to this crowd of Jews. He says, God raised this Jesus to life and we're all witnesses of it. Didn't Jesus say they'd be his witnesses? Peter's saying we are his witnesses. Verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God. Do you know that Peter understood what that ascension meant? He understood that Psalm 10 was being fulfilled. That there was someone, the master of King David, who was Jesus, his his descendant. The master of King David had been invited by God to sit at his right hand until his enemies were a footstool. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. You see, the the ascension of Jesus and the pouring out of the Spirit on Pentecost are intertwined. One relies on the other. Jesus said to His apostles before He left, I have to leave, I'm going back to Father, but it's good for you that I go. And as horrifying that thought is, and as terrible as that thought must have been for them, Jesus was adamant, it's good for you if I leave you. And he explained by saying that if I don't leave, I can't send my, the Spirit to you, the Advocate. But if I leave, I can send Him. And I, I need to testify as a man who lives on the continent of North America, in the country of the United States of America and in the state of Pennsylvania, somewhere in the middle there, that I am very grateful and I agree that it's better. That the presence of God is now everywhere His people are rather than in that one human mortal walking around named Jesus of Nazareth. Because if He were still alive 2,000 years later in His mortal body or even in His resurrected body and He stayed over there in Israel, I would have to go there to have the presence of Jesus with me. I have to chase down the presence of Jesus if that's true. But because He left and He was right that this is better, He pours out the Spirit of God because the Father was pleased to give His Son this job in this role in the story. The Son pours out the Spirit which will be effectively the presence of Jesus among His people. And so when Jesus says, I'm with you always even to the very end of the age at the end of Matthew's Gospel, that is tied directly to His ascending to Father so He can pour out the Spirit so that you and I can have that promise kept that Jesus is with us always even to the end of the age. And you say, how can He be with us? He's at the Father's right hand in heaven. Aha! That's because in His ascension and glorification, He kept His promise and sent us His presence through the Spirit. Now here's the punchline. Here's where I want to make sure we, we focus our thoughts with these things. These aren't just interesting facts of history. Oh, Jesus went back to heaven. Oh, Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Happy birthday, church. You know, and It's not that. It's that knowing that history, we live in the present accordingly. Which means, if the kingdom of God has come, and that was Jesus' message in His mortal and immortal life here on earth, if the kingdom of God has come, that means that the kingdom of darkness is in trouble, and it has its days numbered. So between Jesus' ascension into heaven and His pouring out of the Holy Spirit to Jesus' return the same way He left at an undisclosed future time, we have a church filled and empowered with the presence of her Master. And that means that we have the Word that He had, we have it today. The power to do wonders, we have it today. The compassion 
for the lost and the least, we have it today. The capacity to take people who are fishermen and tax collectors and rebels and what might be considered today terrorists, we, we, can, we can come to those people and offer them a life where they go from whatever they start out to be to becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus who, according to the enemies of their first church, the first disciples, they turn the world upside down. See, the ascension of Jesus and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit has everything to do with you living today. It has everything to do with our church and the churches around us and everyone who calls on the name of Christ and wears His name boldly and beautifully. This means that we are on the move. And when Jesus told Simon Peter that he would be called Peter Rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or, or of death will not overcome it, We are the empowered church in the name of Christ going as a battering ram against the gates of death and the gates of death must yield. They must give way so that those who are dead will pour out of death like the exodus out of Egypt because the gospel brings life to those who will embrace it. And that's what we see beginning in Acts chapter 2 and that's what should be going on to this day in the churches of Jesus Christ. Because once the Spirit comes upon God's people, no power of darkness can stop the advance of God's kingdom. As I finish, can I just remind you one of the metaphors used by the Apostle Paul about the churches, or if you want, the whole church taken all together, is the body of Christ. And as the Holy Spirit filled His mortal body as He ministered on earth 2,000 years ago, so the Spirit of God fills His larger, more uh, complicated body that is the church it's today. And the Spirit is still interested in advancing the kingdom with power, with truth, with justice, with compassion, with grace. And that's where we come in. And so I want us to celebrate the ascension and I want us to remember Pentecost. And I want this to be on our calendars. Not just so that we have another high holy day, but so that we never ever forget who we are because of what He did and where He is and what He's doing. In a people like us, people who are before anything in their lives, disciples of Jesus Christ.